Hello, Professor Vijay Prashad. You are a historian. You are a professor at the university and you are a executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Uh, can you first explain uh, your, um, your uh, career path uh, from India to the United States? Sure, it'll be a pleasure. Um, I'm no longer a professor. That used to be my job. I was a, a teacher for about 20 years and then I left uh, my professional job. Um, I, uh, you know, oscillated through my entire career between journalism and, his, you know, teaching international studies, being a historian, a professional academic. Um, the oscillation came, I think, for two reasons. One was temperament. The other was uh, the conditions of capitalism. Um, I suppose temperamentally, I wasn't fully suited to being an academic. Um, partly because I uh, uh, thought the pace was a bit slow. I felt that um, uh, the kinds of things I was interested in, I didn't see my colleagues being that interested in, to be frank with you. Um, I was in graduate school at the high point of postmodernism, um, post Marxism, post colonialism, post everythingism, and I found that exhausting because I found the world to be. Um, an open wound and open wounds can't be uh, you know you can't put a bandage on them or pretend they don't exist you have to tend to them uh, you know with sensitivity which is part of the human character you have to tend to the wound and you can't ignore it you can't pretend it's not you can't say it's eternal um, I felt that the entire climate after the fall of the Soviet Union um, even in the academy, even people who considered themselves people of the left, I felt very strongly that they um, began to see the wounded. You may do small things, you know. Um, the influence of Michel Foucault, I think, is very interventions and so on. That was not for me temperamentally you know I, i'm just talking temperamentally as a human being i couldn't uh, accept that of course politically i didn't accept that either because uh, it renders for you know billions of people a fate that is inexcusable um, you know there should not be hunger in the world how can i teach young people um, about the the existence of hunger in the world and not at the same time provide them with some avenue to abolish hunger and not, you know, have somebody dismiss that as utopian. Um, because after all, uh, utopia is just another word for humanity. And I just be our kinds of people then within the academic sphere. I just didn't take that seriously. You know, um, Chloe, I've written about, I don't know, 25 books or something. Most of them are not really, uh, you know, reviewed in academic journals. Mm -hmm. They don't drive any academic agenda. Uh, I wrote a book called The Darker Nations, which, you know, uh, is taught a lot, but was not taken seriously. Actually, a non-aligned movement and to study, you know, the Bandung process. It's often seen as a popular book, you know, it gets a footnote and so, but nobody really takes it seriously. You know, the mm -hmm. style, the form, you know, I worked very hard on how to get the style and there's a politics of the style, but it's, that's not, it doesn't engage anybody. What they see about it is, oh, it's interesting, it's readable, it's divergence of parts between a certain kind of academic, you know, trajectory and what I would personally have liked to have been alive in. Yes, I see. So, uh, can we say you are a Marxist historian and a Marxist journalist? And uh, is it an exception, like an exception in the, uh, the, the world uh, today, the intellectual uh, world uh, today? Um, you know, it's a funny thing. Again, Chloe, you have to remember Eric Hobsbawm, the great British uh, mm. Marxist historian made a, a joke once and said that all historians have to be Marxists um, in, a, in a way. I mean, because um, 
if you are serious about looking at the past, you cannot look at the past in a fragmentary way. You have to have a sense of the totality. I mean, you know, I I am not uh, a Foucauldian or anything like that, but I've read Foucault, you know, right through from the first books that are available right through. And the book that I most like is Discipline and Punish. And if you read Discipline and Punish closely, it's not merely a book about prisons. It's a book about the totality. Uh, he makes an argument, which he borrows from the Frankfurt School historians, Gersh and Ruckheimer. He, he actually just pilfers it from them. They get a footnote, but they make an argument about how the transition from feudalism to capitalism has a certain transitional uh, possibility for, for penology, for prisons. And you move from a kind of, um, you know, a concrete punishment, you know, visible punishment to an abstract punishment. And they suggest that that's the, uh, you know, it's related to the shift in the mode of production. Um, it's a very conventional historical materialist argument. And you see Foucault borrowing it entirely, but not engaging with it. You know, he'll dismiss mm -hmm. Marxism, but accept Marxism's historical assessment. So in that sense, yes, I'm a Marxist historian, but I'm not a Marxist historian because I think it's easy for lots of historians to be Marxist in that sense. I also believe in the next phase. In other words, that we can transcend capitalism. And in that sense, I would say Marxist historian, it's a, it can be a, a curiosity. No, I'm a communist historian because I believe that I study the past in order to anticipate the future. And I think that that's a big gap between the history profession and people who believe in a future, you know, that I don't believe that the present is eternal. And therefore, when I study the past, I'm always looking for the dynamic that goes to a social transformation. I'm not studying the past merely to understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. And uh, I think uh, uh, one of your main objectives is also to develop, to to make uh, uh, well known the history of uh, South country, not, not only Western country, but also uh, South uh, third world countries. Uh, can you explain how you, how you are working uh, uh, in this uh, field? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I was born and raised in Calcutta, India at a time when we were, um, we had a government which was um, a communist government. It governed for 34 years in, in West Bengal, a very long time, one election after election, democratic elections, conducted land reform, um, conducted, you know, decentralization of local government. Uh, for the first time, um, you know, working class peasant tribal women came into position that the third world was a place of corruption, was a place of desolation, you know, disease. It was, these were all tropes of the 19th century. Um, you know, it was authoritarian. I mean, there was no difference between the 19th century writers on India and the 20th century scholars on India. You know, it was just mm -hmm. this horrible place. Africa was a horrible place. There was famines, there was this, there was that. But what was, uh, in a sense, there was an amnesia about this middle period from the 1920s, let's say, uh, up to the 1980s, when these countries tried to do something and their attempts were destroyed. So right when I was, um, you know, conscious of politics, Thomas Sankara was assassinated in Burkina Faso. Now, Sankara, in a way, is the last of that era, the last political leader, last political movement to break away from colonialism. And what a brave, brilliant person, you know. He was not permitted to continue. And he was not permitted not only by his colleagues in Burkina Faso, but by the French. Uh, by the Americans, they had various plots and they took care of him. Uh, he was assassinated. Hmm. Um, it's not just Sankara. In the continent of Africa, it starts with Lumumba, 1961, assassinated. Um, you know, assassinated by whom? By the Belgians, by his, his you know, compatriots in the Congo, but also the CIA. Um, every time there's an attempt, it seemed, uh, it had to be destroyed, undermined. 
you know, a million communists killed in Indonesia in 1965. Um, the entire left wiped out in Brazil in the coup that took place in 1964. I mean, these countries weren't barbaric. You know, they were not hopeless. Their hope was snuffed out of them. If you walk into a room, Chloe, and you turn the lights off, the lights go off. But that doesn't mean there's no light in the room. There's no possible light. Somebody fused the lights. And I'm interested in telling the story both of the light that tried to make its appearance in these places and also in how the light was put off. Because I refuse to accept, and I refuse to accept this politically on the one side, but also I refuse to accept it empirically. You know, it's not just a political judgment, it's an empirical judgment. I refuse this empirically because there was a light. Uh, if you take the case of Algeria, it's a really good example. Um, in Algeria, uh, you know, I, I was part of a project. We made a movie called Two Meetings and a, and a Funeral, essentially. Um, it was about the meetings in 1973 in Algiers, the meeting of the non-aligned movement, and then the organization of Islamic conference meeting held in Lahore. But the main meeting was in Algiers, really, um, where, you know, these people came under the leadership of Bomedian, uh, and they made a claim saying we want a new international economic order. It, had, it was going to be passed as a UN resolution. If you go back and read the text of the new international economic order, it's stunning how amazing the world would have been had that been implemented. It's stunning. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you read about the claims they were making on the world. That's the light. And then the light had to be put, 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 you know, shut off. I mean, during the meeting in Algiers, while it was happening, uh, Salvador Allende was being overthrown. And in the meeting room, Indira Gandhi goes to the podium and says, I'm sorry that our, our friend and comrade Salvador Allende is not here with us. He's not here because he's facing something horrible in Chile, you know, and he can't come. The coup didn't happen while the meeting was happening. It happened later. But all the tremors of the coup were there. And so Allende is overthrown. Bumedian is murdered. I mean, you just look at the roster of people at NAM, the non-aligned meeting in Algiers in 73. It's stunning. And so that's what I was interested in, the light, but then also how the light was put off and whether the light can be put on again. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. And uh, so you, you wrote, uh, I counted, you wrote uh, 30 books. So they are uh, very uh, documented uh, books. So I suppose, uh, how did you proceed? You, you read a lot of uh, archives and a lot of books in uh, several languages, uh, archives. How did you proceed to, to write all these uh, books, history books? <laughs> It's very interesting. Um, the first thing, Chloe, the, the trick of the trade is I received no research grant since perhaps 1991. That's the mm -hmm. trick, uh, because I didn't waste any time writing grant proposals or feeling depressed when getting rejected. Um, I think one of the things that happens to lots of young scholars is that that road um, becomes both hope and devastation. Uh, you know, you can lose a year of your life by writing the grant and you can use a, lose a year by the trauma of being rejected. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just <laughs> decided, forget it. So I financed most of my research in two different ways. Um, one, by journalism. So I would get, say, you know, somebody to send me to Singapore to write a story. And I'd spend two, three extra days and I'd go into the archive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in most archives in places like Singapore, the archivists are incredible, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say, look, I'm interested in this aspect of, of uh, what happened, you know, Rajaratnam's papers. And in three days, you can read the papers or take photographs of them, copy them. That mm -hmm. is all possible. Yes. Then the second way, which I think is very valuable, has been valuable for me, is I couldn't get to Belgrade, for instance. So I contacted a professor there who also edits a journal. And I said, you know, professor, would you, would you mind going to the archive for me and looking at these kinds of materials? I'm interested in whether the Yugoslavian government had papers on the non-aligned meeting 61. Would you mind going and doing this for me? And in exchange, if you ever need anything from these following types of archives, I'll be happy to look for you. Mm -hmm. And he wrote me back within a few hours, Chloe. That's what's interesting. He wrote me back in a few hours and said, I would, he didn't know me. We had never met. 
he had no he had no idea who i was i had little idea because he was an editor of a major journal he was a relatively senior person he said i would love to do it it's a, such an interesting project he sent me material so you know there are ways in which we need to perhaps create collaborative projects you know and i don't mean that he and i then wrote an article together nothing he sent it to me freehold as it were you know mm. you use it as you will um very helpful um, the other thing is that i i am not a serious scholar who believes i must exhaust a set of archival materials that kind of scholar is very valuable and you know people like me rely on their work a lot you know somebody who spends two years reading through all the papers of a certain you know set of events or a certain kind of archive very valuable work um and you know people like me certainly rely on that very much and are indebted to it um but you know that that's a certain sort of book or a certain sort of uh, account which is important um mm-hmm. but that in a way is a scholar's that's scholar's scholarship um you know i i'm interested in people's scholarship it taking the scholar's scholarship and giving it to a different kind of audience mm-hmm. um because i don't believe that those incredible books in the libraries i don't believe they should just be for scholars uh, how do mm-hmm. we convert that wisdom you know uh, for a wider audience mm-hmm. yes i see and um uh, can you uh, tell us about uh, your uh, your action now you are executive director of the tricontinental institute for social research um what is uh, your activity at this uh, at this post sure um you know the uh, for many years after the fall of the ussr and the rise of globalization um the world social forum took place in brazil particularly initially in porto alegre and then you know moving around eventually there were european social forum asian social forum and so on um this sort of ran out of steam if you remember about 10 years ago it just it couldn't sustain itself it had become largely an ngo formation and so on and then um a group of uh, political organizations particularly the landless workers movement in brazil and so on held a conference about 5 years ago called dilemmas of humanity and out of that conference they decided to create a intermovement platform called the international people's assembly which today has about uh, 200 organizations uh, spread out over 100 countries you know and big organizations like the communist party of nepal workers party of tunisia um, patria grande in argentina landless workers in in brazil and so on and so as part of the people's assembly they were interested in creating a research institute an intermovement research institute and uh, tricontinental comes out of that process uh, we are you know we are in a kind of partnership with the people's assembly and i was asked to uh, set it up and run it you know for the initial period um, we have offices in india buenos aires uh, johannesburg and sao paulo and um, we have about 30 odd people who work for us um we do research along a series of axes we call it movement driven because our researchers most of them with phd's um, and with movement experience are directly in touch with movements and we look we converse constantly with movements to look for gaps um things that movements don't know things that movements don't know that they don't know that's important mm-hmm. yes Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. They are not also. They don't have a God view. You know, they are also human, and and then yeah. So that's how we create a gender. Okay. Um a last question uh my topic is uh, the history of united nations uh what do you think uh i i repeat uh my topic is uh, Please, the hist- 
history of the United Nations. What do you think uh, was the role of the United Nations since the creation in 1945 uh, in the international relations and uh, on uh, third world countries particularly? And particularly, sorry. Uh, uh, I think uh, um, the role of the United Nations, do you think it was, was it a positive role for third world countries, for the third world, for the South, global South countries? You know, a few years ago, I edited a book with Karim Maktisi uh, called Land of Blue Helmets. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the subtitle is the UN in the Arab world. And in the introduction, we make a point um, of saying that the United Nations is at least two different entities. One is the political side. And let's say it's the tussle between the Security Council that I think against the UN Charter has taken power away from the General Assembly. And on the other side are the agencies. These are the two different worlds of the UN. The agencies have become almost international band-aids. You know, without them, suffering in the world would be much greater. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what UNICEF does, what uh, w, uh, WHO is doing right now in the pandemic, what uh, FAO does, you know, um, these are very important. Actually, I should divide the agencies into two. There are these agencies like UNICEF, FAO and so on that do what I think is essentially if there was a God, this is God's work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are out there in, the, in war zones helping people and so on. There's another set of agencies that are the regulatory bodies, like the World Inter uh, International Property Organization, WIPO, and you know, so on. And I'm less interested in them because I mm -hmm. think they are, create the regulatory framework for capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually think that's the role of the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this, is, this should be a private entity. You know, mm -hmm. why, why if you have to have a private sector capitalism, should the world's resources go towards maintaining intellectual property registers, you know? So I'm not, I think that there are UN agencies that are sort of holding up capitalism. I'm not interested mm -hmm. in them. I don't think they do God's work. Yes. These are really tremendous agents and they don't get enough, you know, including UNESCO just mm -hmm. doesn't get enough respect. And the United States attack on UNESCO, UNICEF, WHO, it's actually telling that mm -hmm. the agencies that are doing such good work are the ones attacked by the US, mm -hmm. largely at the behest of, of Israel. Um, because... Mm -hmm. These agencies essentially for the Palestinians are all that the Palestinians have. Uh, so the attack on UNICEF, UNESCO, um, ANARWA, of course, uh, are all on the grounds of what they've been doing for Palestinians. Um, yes. You know, it's, it's quite interesting. Yes. Uh, but it's in general. I mean, the WHO, this is a ridiculous attack by the US. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Yes. Then there's the political side, which is um, the Security Council, uh, General Assembly and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DESA. Um, they set the political terms of UN action. And if you look at the charter, uh, which I think is an incredible, you know, I have it sitting somewhere. It's an incredible document. The charter doesn't say that the Security Council is the executive of the world. The charter mm. just doesn't say that. Oh, uh, okay. The mm. charter essentially says that the General Assembly is effectively the world's parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the world's parliament, then the parliament should set the politics, you know, of the UN. Mm -hmm. But the United States from the 70s, you know, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan was sent to the UN, he wrote a book about it called the dangerous, A Dangerous Place, talking about the UN. Moynihan mm -hmm. went there to delegitimize the General Assembly. And he did it. He succeeded by using the Zionism is racism resolution to say that they are a bunch of races and they took the Security Council and made it the executive. That was a historical political action. Yes. And in doing that, they essentially made the UN an instrument, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union, the UN becomes the politics of the UN is an instrument of Western power. Mm -hmm. It's very unfortunate. Um, you know, it's very unfortunate because the potential of the UN is being squandered. Mm. Um, UNCTAD, for instance, the UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development has tried in the last 20 years to offer an alternative to, you know, this rampant austerity-driven capitalism, has attempted an alternative. They tried to close it down. 
Many times they've tried to defund UNCTAD and to make the OECD, which is essentially first the European Economic Development Agency and now includes some of the G7 countries, many mm -hmm. of the G20 countries actually, mm -hmm. They wanted the OECD rather than the UNCTAD. Why? Because yes. in UNCTAD, you know, countries like Mali and so on have a vote. And mm. this is the enduring racism, imperialism, whatever you call mm -hmm. it. They would prefer the U.S. drive the agenda, U.S. Treasury Department, then mm -hmm. allow the, the finance minister of, you know, I don't know, Bangladesh to have a seat at the table. I mean, yes. let's face it. Uh, this is a, yes. it's a kind of 21st century racism which we don't mm. talk about you know we, we say yes. we talk about seriousness and who's serious i mean mm -hmm. really you think emmanuel macron is a serious politician <laughs> not in my eyes mm. Mm. yes um last question what is your next project your your next book what's the subject of your next project well i have a book coming out in july mm -hmm. it's called washington bullets And it's mm -hmm. about the history of coup d'etats um, mm -hmm. conducted mainly by the United States. Um, in the, the middle section is on Guatemala, but it goes all the way till the coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia. And the preface of the book is written by Evo Morales um, because, I mean, he has really been the last person uh, to face Washington's bullets. And so that will come out in July. And his preface is quite beautiful because he writes with feeling. I mean, he was removed from office in November last year. And if you draw a straight line between the ejection of Arbenz in Guatemala in mm. 54 yes. to Evo Morales 2000, it's a straight line. Mm -hmm. I'm also writing a short biography of Ho Chi Minh. And oh. uh, I'm very excited about this, Chloe, because he's a, he's a hero of mine. Um, he also, unfortunately, is not taken seriously as a thinker. Yes. Um, this is an interesting feature of the racism of Marxism. Um, mm. People like Ho Chi Minh, um, you know, uh, Nambudripad in India, um, Mahdi Amel in Lebanon and so on. But more people like Ho Chi Minh, they are seen as action-oriented figures, not thinkers. Mm -hmm. The thinkers are Lukács, the thinkers are Adorno, the thinkers are European. Mm -hmm. um, Actors in the left are in the third world. Yes. And I think that's a particularly unfortunate thing. Like Che Guevara was not just an actor in the world. He had a theory. I mean, he tried to theorize socialism. But we mm. don't take his ideas seriously. We don't take Chavez's ideas seriously. It's the ideas of Europe and it's the actions of the people in the third world. And I, I want to take Ho Chi Minh seriously because I think he was, he made contributions to Marxism that need to mm. be acknowledged. You know? Yes. Yes, very interesting. So looking forward to uh, reading your next book. And uh, thank you very much, Vijay Prashad. Thanks a lot, Chloe.